Dave Friedberg, CEO of the Production Board. Welcome to the show. It's so great to have you on. Thank you for having me, Julia. Excited to be here. I'm really excited to have this conversation uh, with you, especially as someone who listens to the All In podcast, always waiting uh, to get some knowledge bombs from you uh, when, for all things science. Uh, for folks who aren't familiar with you, Dave, can we go back and kind of revisit your origin story a bit about your background? Um, sure. I was born in South Africa. I moved to L.A. when I was six. My parents are documentary filmmakers, and I ended up going to Cal Berkeley, uh, where I majored in astrophysics. And then during the dot-com bubble uh, in the 2000 era, um, I decided to go work in tech in uh, Silicon Valley. And uh, that's what I did. And I ended up at Google in 2004. It was still a private company, a couple hundred employees. Um, left at the end of 06 and started the Climate Corporation, which is a uh, software company focused on agriculture. And so it became kind of the predominant software tool that farmers use to track and analyze their farming operation. The business was acquired by Monsanto, Evil Monsanto in 2013. And um, I... Uh, worked broadly across uh, the Monsanto uh, business as a member of the executive team. Um, I started a few other businesses, made some investments, and ultimately set up the production board as a holding company, uh, initially in partnership with Alphabet, um, formerly Google, uh, where they became investors in my holding company. Um, we have a lot of other investors in the production board, and we primarily start and invest in businesses spanning food, agriculture, biomanufacturing, human health, broadly the life sciences, increasingly looking at other areas of interest. Um, and so, you know, we do a lot of work that I, I would say is that kind of the frontier of science and engineering meets some of these more um, traditional but big and important markets. Um, and so that's the, that's the setup. Yeah, that's the setup. Well, I do want to just kind of dig in just a little bit more with you um, to get some more color there. And um, you mentioned um, studying like astrophysics. Like, how how did you get in, interested in science growing up? What was that for you that made you kind of want to pursue that field? Um, I don't know. I think understanding how and why everything is the way it is, <laughs> and uh, science is the best way. It's a it's a method. It's a system for uh, interrogating the universe and trying to resolve to understand it better. Um, you know, the, the basis of the scientific method is you have a hypothesis and then you test that hypothesis and run experiments and discover new things and, and iterate. And eventually you form a better and better understanding of why things are the way they are. And that scientific method can be applied to sociological phenomena, like how humans behave to um, financial and economics, uh, to um, you know, physical sciences, to chemistry, to biology. And so we have this ability as a species to sense, to understand, and to predict. Um, and science is a, a system by which we can uh, use those tools uh, and improve our ability to, to better understand, better predict, and better shape the world and the universe around us. I like um, that. Yeah. Yeah, I like. I could also maybe see how that might apply to entrepreneurship, as well. Um, before we kind of get more into the production board, can we focus a bit more on like your earlier days in entrepreneurship and what sort of lessons um, did you take away from those experiences? Founding, you know, you mentioned a few companies, um, uh, Climate Corporation being one of them, Metromile. What were some of the key learnings for you? Well, when I started Climate Corp. Um, I left Google in 2006 to start it, and I went around to a bunch of venture capital firms, and none of them wanted to invest in it. Um, you know, I had two VCs who, or a VC friend of mine who had kind of given me a small uh, check, but I'll, he's like, let's go introduce you to other VCs, and we'll raise a Series A round so you can have some money to start this company. And I didn't really have the money because uh, none of the VCs would invest in it. Uh, you know, it was an idea and a PowerPoint or whatever, but. I had to go raise money by kind of soliciting all my friends who had made a bunch of money from Google's IPO and networking my way to investors and eventually cobbled together a small seed round, 
which gave me enough capital to, to leave Google and start this business. And then, um, you know, the original concept for the business was we were going to simulate the weather and sell weather insurance online. And this was in 2006. So, you know, using data to create statistical simulations and have a, a website where people could buy weather insurance was a little bit kind of out there. Um, I ended up needing to go to a lot of trade shows to sell weather insurance. I mean, I've literally been to more trade shows than anyone you've met, uh, passing out umbrellas, uh, selling to the golf course owners association, the car wash owners association, many different farming conferences, um, travel association conferences, because all of these different industries were affected by the weather in different ways. And I would just pitch this idea on, Hey, you should insure your business against rain or, heat waves or drought or whatever, ski resorts. We sold to a lot of ski resorts, hydroelectric plants. Um, and, you know, by, we, we launched in January of 07. By 2009, we focused the company exclusively on agriculture. And then after we launched in agriculture, we really uh, iterated very quickly on the products we were offering farmers. Um, and it became a much more easy to consume, easy to use product. And so during that first, it's amazing that all of that happened in two and a half years because we went from just this kind of idea to this very narrowly focused, highly optimized sales model and business and product that I think was really important as I think in hindsight for our success was our ability to, in the scientific method <laughs> that I talked about earlier, you know, have a hypothesis on what would work, test it with customers, and then when it didn't work, very quickly iterate and try again. And it was a, it allowed us to rapidly evolve this business into what ultimately became software for farming by 2010. And so in just over three years, this business became um, a very focused product that worked well and started to scale. Um, and I think that that was really important as I observe a lot of startups and entrepreneurs and folks that, that we kind of work with or I've seen, um, that have challenges, the rate of iteration, the pace of iteration is one of the strongest predictors of how likely that company is to succeed. Um, if you take too long to make a change, or if you take too long to observe what's not working and then make a change, um, you run out of money and you die. And so, um, you know, I think that was really important that I, I don't know, I think maybe I just had an instinct for it at the time. Um, not everyone is wired that way. I see a lot of people who are more about analysis than action, and they'll spend so long analyzing something and thinking about the different permutations and iterations without actually doing anything or trying something. And you have to run experiments constantly to find your path in life, to find your path in your business. Um, and I see a lot of people fail to do that. And so that, that was a really important takeaway for me um, the other one was just grit or determination. I mean, you know, I cannot tell you how many no's I got, how many rejections I got, how many times we failed, how many times our customers hated what we gave them. We went through pissed off customers all the way through to lawsuits from customers, um, all the way through to every investor in Silicon Valley I've been rejected by countless times. Even still to this day, I get rejected by them. And um, uh, and I, I think that the the simple model of success in life is you do something, you succeed, you consider yourself successful. But then when you get knocked down, it's very hard to think about yourself still being successful or having the potential to be successful if your model, your learned model is success. And so um, getting knocked down over and over again, particularly early in my career or early in those days, I think prepared me well for being equipped to have the grit needed to persist and continue to push even in the face of things not working. Um, and I think that's another critical success factor for nearly every business um, that's starting out in this kind of startup phase. So th those are two really important kind of takeaways on entrepreneurism for me that arose. And I still really try and apply those as principles in every business I look at investing in today. I really look at how gritty the team can be and what informs me that they have that grit ability and how, um, uh, how much of a bias to action they have and how quickly they can and will iterate their business to success because no business plan is executed perfectly. Every business plan is a plan until you get punched in the face and then you have to iterate.
Um, mm -hmm. And so one's ability to quickly and rapidly iterate, I think is key. So I, those are those are really important early lessons for me. I really like those lessons and it's really helpful for everyone who's going to be watching and listening. So the takeaway is um, that bias to action and grit. And I've also heard you talk about a third one, which is narrative. Can you weigh in yeah. on the importance of narrative? Yeah. So those are my three traits um, that I think are the greatest predictors of entrepreneurial success. And you cannot tell me of a successful story of entrepreneurism where the entrepreneur did not exhibit an extraordinarily high index on at least one of those three traits. So grit, if you never give up, you definitionally will not die. <laughs> you could get paid zero salary, have no office and keep going. Um, and that business eventually will find a path. Bias to action, if you have the ability to rapidly iterate, infinitely iterate, uh, think about the movie Groundhog Day. What if you could have a hundred days in one? The person who can more quickly iterate can come to the perfect outcome faster than the other person who can't and has a higher probability of success because they don't burn through all their money before they find a path that generates cash and succeeds. And the third is narrative. And narrative, I think, you know, the, um, the biggest distinction between the human species and all other species on earth is, um, is our ability to storytell. And our ability to storytell is really about creating um, a, a mental uh, image of something that doesn't exist in front of you here and now today. And that is what allows people to work in cooperation. We are going to build a building. So you describe the building and everyone works together to make that mental image a reality. Um, or here's what the world will look like if we do X, Y, and Z. And that statement inspires people to do X, Y, and Z. Storytelling is the basis of um, uh, emotional context development for you know, all um, uh, experiences we have as humans. It comes from how we communicate and what we communicate to one another to create mental models in the listener. And I think storytelling is the most powerful tool we have as a species. It can allow us to resolve war. It can allow us, it can, um, gives us this ability to inspire, to motivate, to change the universe and the world around us. The individuals who possess a strong storytelling trait, an ability to paint um, a, a picture that elicits emotional context in the listener in a way that drives them to act is a person that can infinitely fundraise, that can attract and recruit the best employees, that can sell customers on a product that doesn't even exist yet. So the stronger one's storytelling ability, I would argue the more likely they are to succeed as an entrepreneur. And tactically speaking, great storytellers can always raise money. And so if you have a guy like Adam Newman or a guy like um, uh, Elon Musk, or a guy like Steve Jobs who could just get in a room and everyone listens to their every word and everyone is moved by what they say and inspired or driven to act by what they say, that person can always raise money. And Elon for years had business issues. This thing didn't work, bankruptcy was at risk, yada, yada. He was always able to raise money. And that's because he could get in a room and he could tell a story about the world that's gonna be electrified and EVs and so on, and now becoming a spacefaring civilization. And so the great storyteller will always be able to raise money, will always be able to attract the best talent to people to come and work on something that doesn't exist, and will be able to sell customers in a way that the other person can't. Um, and I think that that's the third most powerful, you know, the third powerful trait. And so index high on grit, uh, bias to action or narrative, and I would argue um, your probability of success is significantly improved. I, I, this is so great and super helpful when you unpack it. And you're right, like narratives is just like part of like the human experience. So my quick follow on question is, can someone learn to be a good storyteller? Or is it just something that's, you know, inherent within someone? Or is it something that you can evolve and get better at over time? Yeah, I, I ask this question a lot. I mean, I've, I've said to my team, like, we should have training programs on becoming good storytellers. And we should get movie makers and filmmakers and animators and writers to come and tell us how to tell a good story and help people do that. Um, I, I Look, I'll also say, I think there, there, there's an incredibly, in, so I do think that everything is learnable. 
um, every, any human can improve to any condition they want to improve to if they have the necessary will. So uh, I'm a big believer in the, the, the human potential. I, I don't think that any of us have any limits. Um, you know, uh, like Ethan Hawke and Gattaca, <laughs> like I'm genetically predisposed to not tell good stories, but if I practice anything enough times, um, I can get good at it. Um, and I can, but I do think some people have an incredibly innate sense on how to do this. And, and you've seen this um, in countless entrepreneurial success stories where there's that individual who walks in the room and they just know how to speak to the room and they just know how to tell a story. And we've all met and seen people like this. So there's certainly uh, a natural uh, trait that, that exists in some people out there, but I do believe that people have the ability uh, to improve themselves um, and get strong at this. But absolutely everyone has the ability to bias to act. Um, and I think that that one is one where you really have to be willing to embrace failure because when you take an action quickly without the complete analysis, let, let me just give you an example. I see a lot of people who were consultants or went to really good schools and then got a job at Google. And then they've always had this path where they made the right choice and then it worked out and as they expected it to. And so the, therefore they always make the safe choice. And the safe choice is I know what I'm getting into, therefore I know what the result will be. The problem is when you're trying to do something new, you cannot figure out um, without trying and failing what is gonna work. And so it becomes an extremely uncomfortable moment for the person who has historically been more of an analyst than um, a risk-taking action-oriented um, uh, agent. And now you have to go into a situation where you're used to analyzing all the angles, making sure you know what you're gonna do, making sure it's gonna work, and then once you're comfortable doing it, because you know you're going to have success, now you've got to dive in and do the thing that you don't know what's going to happen. You're going to take a risk. And that's why bias to action is so hard and so uncomfortable for successful people. Uh, and it's also why so many successful entrepreneurs do not come from the traditional backgrounds of repeated success. Um, it's because they're willing to embrace failure. And then you have to do failure and failure and failure over and over and over and over again. Um, and eventually something works and then you pursue that path. So um, I think that one's very learnable. Um, and then grit is a very hard one. I think grit is one that's driven by uh, not, ge not genetics um, and less about training and is actually much more about one's personal experiences in life. It's why you see so many immigrants do so well as entrepreneurs in the United States and why so many successful entrepreneurs were or are first or second generation immigrants. Uh, because um, you know they they really did go through the, the the perseverance and push through the hardship and not resolve back to the more comfortable situation in order to try and craft a better life and outcome for themselves and their families in the past and they've learned that the challenges are part of the success um, and so grit I think is something that comes from experience and it's very hard for someone who comes from a comfortable life with continued success. I would argue to, um, uh, you know, there, there's certain people that are athletes and have been through training, but um, there are certain elements of experience that I think um, uh, uh, give someone's uh, grit trait uh, a stronger sense. Yeah. You know, one of the things I really admire about you, Dave, is um, you're an extreme optimist and you focus on working on really hard problems. And I do want to talk about the production board and uh, specifically, um, TPB is pursuing a mission of reimagining Earth at this pivotal moment in human history. And I was hoping we could kind of start there and get your views on exactly this pivotal moment um, and just kind of extrapolate from there. On on, t on for forming TPB? Yeah, for our kind of what, what your focus is with the production board, kind of uh, the big picture macro view of reimagining Earth. Yeah, so I mean... Um so much of our industry today, um, the things that we as people consume are produced through industrial processes. And what that means is there's some um, big system that's been designed to take a bunch of stuff in, convert it, and turn it into a bunch of stuff um, and make it available to everyone very cheap. This was 
enabled and accelerated by um, uh, the electrification, uh, by uh, you know, the, the utilization of electricity uh, and other energy systems as drivers in the uh, 19th century. So if you go back a couple hundred years, everything that we would make and consume was a one-to-one -one relationship. Um, merchants would make stuff. You would go down to your village or town or whatever, and a merchant would you know, typically hand make stuff, or maybe they would use some machine to make stuff that, that had some mechanical elements to it, but was still, still needed to be driven. And that machine would put out a product, um, or, or that individual would put out a product, and I individually would buy that product. The, um, the system of factories and the first, second industrial revolutions really changed the, the nature of how we make and consume things by centralizing production and scaling it up. And so all these inputs, whether it was electricity or a wheat um, or cotton, got driven into one big factory, one big machine, which then typically used, started to use steam engines and turbines and um, uh, electricity uh, and other sources of fuel to output stuff that we all consume that was very kind of cookie cutter and similar for everyone. And so it, it really unlocked consumerism and it allowed our population to swell from you know, a billion to 7 billion people or a couple hundred million are arguably to 7 billion people. Um, because now we could make things um, much more rapidly that people could consume clothing, material, houses, uh, food, um, uh, all consumer goods. Um, and then we kind of got to this place where everyone got everything they wanted and we all got the same thing, right? We, you, the, the factory makes the same thing over and over again. Um, and, the, it, and, and the problem with the system over you know, 150 years, 200 years now, is we're realizing that the energy requirements to do this and the way that we do this is largely inefficient. We've taken old school ways of doing things and we've just scaled them up and then we've pumped energy in uh, uh, to repeat them over and over again. And as a result, we're putting a lot of carbon in the atmosphere and fundamentally these systems are inefficient. And what I mean by that is like, let's take animal protein as an example. To make um, a gram of animal protein it, or let's say a, a, a hundred calories of animal protein, it takes 3000 calories of energy into a system to make that animal protein. So we will spend roughly three years to make a burger. Okay, we've got to mine potash and phosphate from Morocco and, and Russia. Then we ship it to the US. We, we make ammonia from fertilizer plants, then which uses electricity. We take those three ingredients, that's fertilizer. We put it on the ground, we grow corn. We wait nine months to harvest the corn. We take the corn, we send it to a field we, or to a, a feedlot. We, we grow cows for two years. We slaughter the cow. We pump it, you know, lots of water gets pumped in. And then we turn the cow into beef and we ship it to New York on carbon emitting trucks. And then a steakhouse in New York gets a, a you know, a, a T-bone and you eat it. Um, so the total energy of that system is 30 to one. And it takes three years to make that, that steak. So that system is like, we, it's the same way we made cows 5,000 years ago. Uh, and um, you know we put fertilizer in the ground, we grow plants, feed animals, and so on. And the same is true for making clothes. The same is true for making a lot of materials and a lot of the products that we consume. We've kind of taken old technologies, industrialized them to make them cheap and ubiquitous. And the reality is we have all these new technologies today where we could reinvent how we're making the stuff that we consume as a species from clothing to materials, to plastics, to food. Um, you know, uh, nearly everything that we make as a species could be reinvented using some modern set of technology. So biomanufacturing is a good example. Rather than make a mechanical machine and a chemical machine that, that, that kind of, you know, take stuff apart and make stuff, we could actually engineer a living cell to make plastic, for example, or bioplastic. We could engineer a yeast cell to make the, the meat that we might uh, consume or to make milk or to make eggs. We can actually engineer cow cells and get them to grow in large tanks to make the exact chemical identical replica of steak. And there's so many examples of this um, leather, silk, um, uh, I mentioned plastics. And I think that there is this tremendous opportunity between biomanufacturing, um, automation, 3D printing or additive manufacturing, all these different systems that we can 
modularize and decentralize production. So it doesn't all have to happen in one big factory. We can have systems all over that can make all the things we consume locally. And we can make them more personably so they can you know, be tuned to an individual. And so my, my broad general set of interest is really around how do we make things better on planet Earth that people need that can improve human health, that can improve our uh, footprint and sustainability on the planet, that can make things cheaper, that can make them faster, that can make them easier to access, that can make them better, personalized cell and gene therapy, personalized vaccines. Um, uh, you know, everything in medicine can be rewritten. Uh, so there's a whole set of principles around this idea that if we use modern technology and we think about deindustrializing, we can reinvent so much of the stuff that we make and consume as a species. That's the general set of things that I'm interested in. That was a super long-winded uh, explanation for you, but fa that's, that's generally the stuff that we're interested in. Um, yeah. it, it, does not, it doesn't bother me that it's long-winded because I'm learning a ton in the process, and I'm so grateful that you're you're here sharing uh, this. And kind of one of my, my takeaways is um, it's not like this kind of form of sustainability. It's not like, oh, you have to cut back and you can't have all these things. It's using tech to solve the problem. So you can still have these the things that we want as consumers, but it's in a more decentralized model. Is that kind of what I'm hearing? Yeah. Anti-consumerism, I think, is dumb. And I'll tell you why it's dumb. It's dumb because people want to have more than they have tomorrow than they have today. That's that's what drives the human species and has there's a, there's a broader philosophical argument around the, some principles in thermodynamics that actually predict this about why the universe evolves the way it does. Um, but but but. Just speaking about the human psychology, we always desire. Um, and desire is a simple condition. It is the condition to have what you don't have. And um, we are hardwired for evolutionary reasons to always desire, which means that we always want more than what we have today. So let's say I make $60,000 this year and I was making $50,000 last year. I feel pretty good. If I'm making $60,000 next year, I'm not in a worse place. I'm still making $60,000, but I don't feel good. I feel bad because my desire drives me to want to make more, to want to have more. I always want to have another car. I always want to have more food. I want to have more kids. There's a lot of elements that drive so much of human behavior um, and consumerism. And, and what drives economic growth um, is, is the human desire. Um, for, for, and so as a result, Everyone wants to have more next year than they have this year. And that's what drives the, um, the systems that, that deliver us the things that we want. So the idea that you can get people to, quote, think green, be sustainable by um, consuming less, um, by taking less in, is a fallacy. It is not evolutionarily possible. And yes, for some percentage of the population, maybe you can discipline yourself to say, hey, I don't want this. But generally, 95% plus of people, they just want to have more stuff than they have today. If you've never eaten meat and you start to eat meat, you're like, hey, I want more meat. And you know, the first time a child eats sugar, that kid wants more sugar. And as soon as you're able to buy a nicer car, you want to upgrade the car. And so I would argue that our objective shouldn't be about, uh, in sustainability, uh, shouldn't be about, hey, can we get people to consume less? It should be, can we get people to consume more? Can we give people 10 times, 100 times, 1,000 times more than they have today? And in doing so, it makes us solve the productivity problems. And the productivity problems ultimately resolve the sustainability problems, which is, can you make a lot more with a lot less? And there are tools to do that across nearly anything that we want to consume. And if we can do that, then you actually give people what they want while making things more sustainably. And so my argument is that we already have on this planet and in our knowledge banks as a species today, all the tools and all the abilities we need to make everything we want to consume with less. You don't have to not have steak. You don't have to not have eggs or milk or nice clothes. You should be able to have it all. And you should be able to have it all at a lower cost. And technology allows us to do that. So I'm a big optimist in the te technological sense that we have all the tools and we can and should be driving towards building better systems to make all the things that people want. Um, and that's a that's a kind of big principle for me. Yeah, um, it's it's important too. I, I again, I appreciate you sharing and, and breaking it down. And um, let's do an example of this. Um, and that would be Canna. Um, which is a molecular beverage printer. I would love for you to explain it and how it actually would tie into uh, what we were just discussing. 
Yeah, I'm, so you know, people spend two trillion dollars a year on canned and bottled beverages from wine and beer, which is a trillion, to coffee, tea, juice, and soda, which is another trillion. And ultimately, beverages are mostly water. So one percent of a beverage distinguishes it from other beverages. That's the that's the molecules that make up all the odor, flavor, color, and mouthfeel. The rest of the beverage is water, um, and then either some sugar or some alcohol, uh, depending on the beverage. Um, and so juice is 90, you know, 2% water, 7% sugar, 1% is the odor, color, flavor, mouthfeel. Wine is 87% water, 12% alcohol, 1% is the molecules that make up odor, flavor, color, mouthfeel. So, you know, the idea with Canna is can we take that 1% and put it in a cartridge and ship that to people's homes and then they can print any beverage they want on demand. Um, and so you can turn water into... Uh, alcohol into juice, into soda, into coffee, without growing all these tea leaves, without you know making all these coffee beans and harvesting them and crushing them, um, without all of the CO2 that goes into making a glass or plastic bottle, and then using CO2 to ship bottles of water on trucks and vans to stores and to your home. We all already have water pumped into our homes through our pipes. So why not just use that water to make the beverages you want and then just ship the 1% to your home that can differentiate that water into everything you want to consume. So Canna is this, you know, we call it a molecular beverage printer. It's a device that takes water and a flavor cartridge and it's got a, a couple dozen um, uh, wells in the flavor cartridge that, uh, you know, the cartridge, the idea is to last about a month and you can make coffee, tea, juice, soda, cocktails, et cetera, with the, uh, with the one machine. Um, and that's a good example of this principle of decentralizing production. So you don't have one factory making a can of soda over and over again. You don't use all the CO2, plastic, aluminum, glass. You don't ship water around. It's much more efficient. It should be much lower cost. And it ends up making a better product for the consumer because you, it's personalized. Rather than buy the same soda that everyone else is buying, you can tweak the sugar and the, and the vitamins and the color and the flavor and all the things that you want to tweak to make it much more what you would ideally uh, choose. Um, and this principle of decentralization also is showing up in media. Um, you know, Julia, you're here doing a show that you're going to publish on YouTube. Um, you know, 30 years ago, almost all media was produced by a couple of studios, production houses. They had all the money and all the assets and all the resources and the distribution. Then the internet came along. And now technology distributed into our into our home. So we all have a camera. We all have a, a, a Mac with a video camera on it. We've all got an iPhone. And we've all got this ability to publish to each other. And so you no longer need to have, um, and most media consumed today is made in this decentralized way. It's made by individuals making stuff on YouTube and TikTok. So the bulk of media consumed in the United States today is actually produced in a decentralized manner. And it's consumed in a decentralized manner. And I think that we'll see the same thing start to happen in the rest of the century with the production of all other goods that consumers consume. It started firstly with digital um, goods, which is media, but I think it eventually finds its way into physical goods as we decentralize the production system and decentralize the, 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 the creation systems. Um, and so that's a, that's a big principle that I think we take for granted. We think that the industrialized world is all about centralized production. But I would argue that decentralized production is going to kind of sweep over everything this century. Yeah, that's a fascinating thesis. Let's let's tease that out. You mentioned like digital media, and that's thank you for again for coming on the show um, and supporting someone who's an individual creator. But um, like decentralization for the production of goods, are you you're talking about like you know Mr. Beast for example with his Beast Burger um, becoming like a huge thing? I, let's tease this out. What does this look like? Individuals creating more brands? Yeah. So. Um, you know, Kylie Jenner, um, uh, what's her brand called? Um, Kylie, I think. Her Kylie right? Lip or, Kit or something. Her Kylie Lip Kit. Um, so she 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 builds um, a cult following, right? It started out as a cult following. She's now got a, a broad appeal. She's got a broad audience. Um, and so her creation of her content, same with Kim Kardashian, you know, her, her sister, uh, same with Mr. Beast, um, these folks build an audience by using these, these tools for kind of decentralized um, production of media, decentralized consumption of media. That media is consumed. Now they themselves become the trusted brand. 
you know, in the last century, last two centuries, the trusted brands were trusted because they had scale and bulk. Coca-Cola is a big brand. I trust them. I know their product. They make a good product. But Coca-Cola is a nameless, faceless brand. There is no individual attached to Coca-Cola. And there is no um, integrity uh, or authority of an individual. Um, and the individual has a great deal of power and sway. We, we talked about storytelling earlier. Those creators are the storytellers. And they elicit uh, an emotional condition in, in the viewer and the listener that says, I trust this person. And because I trust this person, I will spend money and consume their products. Um, and initially it started out with them providing, and I think this is the phase we're in today, where the brand creator or the, the creators, uh, let's call them that, um, are making recommendations on third-party products. But increasingly, they're realizing that they can actually make their own products and their products will win in the market against the traditional nameless, faceless brand products. And this is happening for, I would say, a few reasons. The first reason is you no longer need, in a lot of cases, retail distribution. It used to be that in order to sell a consumer good, you need to have a physical space on a shelf in a store. And so there's a limited number of slots in a store that you can sell stuff. So you, everyone was fighting and paying for those retail stores to give them space. That's no longer the case because of online e-commerce and shipping. The second is that it's become a lot easier for these people to create brands, for these individual creators to create brands on white label platform type solutions. So you know, through virtual um, brand development, you can actually have something physically made. You don't need to own a factory. You don't need to build stuff yourself. Uh, and that's kind of radically and dramatically changing things. And then finally, is just this ability to have built-in distribution. Um, when you build a big audience, you now have the ability to sell to that audience and your cost of acquisition is nothing because your audience is already with you. So when um, let's say that there's some new um, chocolate company and they launch, they've got to go um, spend money on marketing or pay third parties to, to kind of market for them to bring customers to buy their product. And that creates you know, what people call a CAC, a customer acquisition cost. And the customer acquisition cost is how much did you spend as a marketer to get a new customer? And so for a CPG product, for a direct-to-consumer product where you're trying to sell someone something over the internet, you're spending 50, 100, sometimes a couple hundred bucks to get them to buy your product on marketing dollars before you get a customer to buy your product. If you already have 100 million people following you like Mr. Beast does, he just goes on his video and he says, buy my chocolate bar. And he sells 50 million chocolate bars. And that's what he did. So he used a virtual, what's called a co-packer, to make his chocolate bars for him with his brand on it. He sells the chocolate bar. He makes all the margin on it. And he doesn't have to pay a penny to acquire them because he's already making his videos. He's making his, he's got his audience. And so he's got a chocolate bar company where he's selling a ton of chocolate bars, just like Kylie sells a ton of makeup and Kim sells a bunch of her Skims product. Um, and all of these, um, these kind of, you know, creators are showing that they can become the product brand themselves. And it's a lot easier to do that. What I think will happen now over the next decade, as we saw happen in media in the last decade, is that that'll go to the long tail. And so rather than just be the people with a hundred million followers, I think you'll start to see the people with 500,000 or a hundred thousand followers where the tools will emerge that will allow them to create new consumer product good companies or new consumer product services um, companies with very low cost and um, uh, and very low need to kind of invest and they can white label and so on. And then they can deliver to their smaller audience uh, a custom branded product. And so you'll see this massive fragmentation of brands that'll happen. Uh, I will point out in the beverage industry, we've already seen this happen. So you know it used to be that Miller and Budweiser were the bulk of sales of beer and now there's like 700 microbrews in the U.S. that in aggregate outsell those big brands. And microbrews have totally taken over the U.S. beer market. Um, and that's because everyone wants to feel as a consumer that I've got my personal beer brand that I really like and enjoy. And I think we're seeing that it, with consumers in the U.S. wanting to find their personal thing that they have greater affinity for, the little micro brand that they know about, that they feel like, oh, no one else knows about this. Or a few people, it's kind of a cultish phenomenon or I really love the brand creator and there's something about that brand creator that I, I have an affinity for. And I think we're going to see that across every CPG category 
where local individual or some sort of smaller creator fragments that market. Um, and it totally destabilizes the way that the, the big guys are, are operating today. Um, so that's a big trend I think is going to happen in consumer over the next decade. Yeah. And I suppose with Canna, you probably create an opportunity. We mentioned personalization um, when we were discussing Canna for folks to use their existing brands probably to create new beverages. Is that right? Exactly right. Yeah. So that's a platform play. It's, you know, I think it's one of many platform plays that will emerge over the next decade where there are tools for these creators to monetize and create brands using their audience, leveraging their audience to create something new that the audience trusts them. By the way, think back to, um, you know, when you first started going to Starbucks, why did you love, I mean, do you go to Starbucks? Oh, I love Starbucks. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Like too much. So why do you why do you, why do you love Starbucks? Um, well, I love the app. I think the app's the probably the, one of the, hands down the best uh, one. I like the personalization and uh, yeah. also like I like the relationship I have with the baristas when I go in there. I think what really you know Howard Schultz used to say that Starbucks was like the third the third place. place. It was yeah. like yeah, you know, it was like the home work and and Starbucks. The reality is, I, I disagree with him on this. I think what happened at Starbucks is it became the first personalized consumer product company where there's four quintillion variations or some number of Starbucks you can order. And it was the first time that the, the, the degree of personalization around coffee got so extreme that everyone found their own little version of a coffee that they would make. And they're like, it's my Starbucks. It's my version. It's my product. And I think that that makes a huge difference because that's how we consume media today, right? We, I go on TikTok or YouTube or Spotify, I watch and listen to the media I want to listen to. It's not what the radio DJ tells me to listen to, or NBC tells me to listen to or watch. It's what I choose to watch and what I choose to listen to. And so it becomes my media. And I think we're seeing the same happening in um, in consumer goods, uh, where I'm buying my Starbucks and I go to Starbucks because I can make it so personal that it feels like it's my perfect version. And I think we'll see the same happen in all, you know, we're seeing it in microbreweries. I've got my IPA that I love. Um, and I think we'll see it across every category from clothing um, uh, to food and beverage, even all the way through to services. Yeah. Well, I'm going to sign up for Canna because you got me really excited just about this. It, like literally the idea to like, print something personalized is just incredible. Um, I don't know if you have a go-to favorite drink at this point. But if you do, let me know. Yeah. A little, yeah. I'll, I'll, I think we're going to do some demos at CES. So we'll, uh, we'll give everyone some samples out there. Love it. Um, I want to bring up another topic with you and, um, first came across this on your Twitter account and I want to give us enough time to discuss it, but, um, it's about abundant free energy. And I don't know, like several months ago, you tweeted the greatest source of value and wealth creation in the 22nd century could be driven by terrestrial nucleosynthesis. I was hoping you could explain that and elaborate for the folks listening. So um, the universe is made up of matter and energy. That's it. <laughs> okay. So the whole universe is just matter. And then there's energy in the form of photons and kinetic energy. Um, and kinetic energy refers to the movement of particles relative to one another, of matter relative to itself. So, you know, uh, when things are hot, it's because the atoms are moving very quickly. Um, when things are cold, the atoms are moving slowly. And then there's, uh, you know, photons, which, you know, transmit... Um, uh, electromagnetic energy that, that it gets absorbed. So anyway, that, that's a little too nerdy physics, but, um, you know, all, um, uh, the whole universe is made up of a certain, um, distribution of elements, right? Uh, we've all seen the periodic table of elements, hydrogen, helium, beryllium, lithium, and so on, oxygen, carbon, nitrogen. And, um, if you think back, like what, what humans have figured out how to do over time is we figured out how to take a combination of elements and kind of physically manipulate them. This was kind of the initial thing. So um, the, 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 the Bronze Age um, uh, was when humans figured out that we could heat up certain metals and then meld, meld them together and then make a new kind of metal, a new kind of material. Or we figured out that we could take cotton and uh, you know turn it into thread and then make clothing out of it. Um, and so we, we, we um, manipulated matter mechanically, okay? And that means we applied heat and, and physical manipulation to turn the physical stuff around us into the things that, that we could then use and consume. Um, 
And, uh, you know, we could chop wood. Uh, we even burnt wood to make fire. So these were kind of, you know, physical manipulations of the matter around us that was given to us. And then um, in the 19th century, we started to really grasp this understanding and this ability to do chemical engineering. And so remember, the elements on the periodic table represent atoms. Combinations of atoms are molecules. So H2O is a molecule. What we figured out how to do in the 19th century to a high degree and then industrialized it was how to take molecules and break them apart and recombine those elements into new molecules to make new materials and new things that humans could then use. So we figured out how to make um, medicine by taking a certain number of inputs, using chemical engineering to manipulate them, break apart the molecules, put new atoms back together and make new molecules that became medicines. We did this for medicines. We did it for materials. We created all sorts of new materials like plastics and chemical engineering um, you know, really drove much of the second industrial revolution and allowed humanity to prosper very well through the 20th century. Chemical engineering is this extraordinary, extraordinary accomplishment that allowed us to save ourselves from starvation. When we figured out how to turn nitrogen gas from the atmosphere, compress it to 200 times atmospheric pressure, and then um, run it over an iron catalyst and make um, ammonia. And ammonia became fertilizer that we use to fertilize literally every farm on earth today. And we still use that Haber-Bosch process to make fertilizer. So chemical engineering, but chemical engineering is all about taking the atoms and then turning them into new molecules. It turns out that there's today this critical need for specific atoms that we don't have enough of. And so lithium, we all talk about lithium ion batteries and the importance of lithium. And lithium is fundamentally um, a, a, a natural resource. There's a certain amount of it and it's only in certain places on earth. Same with phosphorus. Phosphorus, we mine, more than half of it is in Morocco. Um, and, uh, and we need that phosphorus to turn into fertilizer around the world. Um, and there's a number, you know, uranium, plutonium. I mean, you know, th there's a number of elements that are um, in limited supply on this rock that we call earth. And we dig into the earth and we mine and we spend a ton of energy and we drill and we rip stuff apart and we isolate it. Um, and I think it's really incredible to think that we are, are scrambling around like gophers in a field trying to find the, the little bits of elements that we want. We have these things called particle beams that we use for experimental physics, high energy physics, where you can actually combine elements and make a new element. So you can squish hydrogen and hydrogen together, slam them together and get helium. Um, actually, get, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but um, you know, uh, theoretically we could take helium and helium, smash it together, make beryllium and it turns into lithium. Um, so there's an incredible um, uh, uh, um, feat of physics uh, nucleosynthesis, which is how do how are all heavy elements created? So everything started out in the universe as hydrogen. And in stars, because of fusion, the incredible compression of hydrogen turned it into helium, turned it into iron, turned it into oxygen, turned it into carbon. All the elements we have in the universe today exploded out of stars billions of years ago and formed all the stuff we have on Earth today. So everything on Earth today, with the exception maybe of the hydrogen, came out of exploded stars. And there's only a certain amount of it. Now, what stars do is they're at such a high energy that the, the atoms in the star bang into each other at such a high rate that they fuse and create new elements. And the, the protons stick together, form a new nucleus, and now you've got a heavier element. It is such an energy intensive action that it is fe um, feasible, infeasible today to do this uh, on Earth. What's happening now is we have this new technology uh, called plasma fusion um, that has been in development for decades. And by the way, every year, everyone's like, hey, it's a decade away. So take this with a grain of salt. But there will come a time when humans will master the ability to do plasma fusion systems on Earth. And our objective with plasma fusions is we create a condition that's like the sun where you take hydrogen and you know you compress it and you make it so energetic and it's moving at such a high energy that those hydrogen atoms slam into each other. And when they slam into each other, they fuse and they form heavier elements 
and they also release energy. And the energy that they release because of the conversion of matter into energy in that process is more than the energy you put into the system to start the system running. And it creates an infinite energy source, which is what the sun is. The sun is fusing hydrogen and helium and releasing photons and releasing neutrinos and all this energy comes out into the universe and it literally lights up the sky every day. That is what the sun is. It's converting mass into energy. And it's what we can do in a plasma fusion reactor. And one of the benefits of a system like that, if and when it works, is infinite energy in the sense that we could convert hydrogen into electricity to run all of our machines. And if you look at the amount of electricity that humans consume on planet Earth today, it would take about a 10 meter by 10 meter by 10 meter cube of ocean water to make all the electricity that we consume today if we could put that into a plasma fusion system and fuse it and, and release it completely as energy. That's how little matter it would take to, to create energy for the Earth. So it's an incredible prospect. It will happen at some point. It's technically complicated and there's a lot of issues with getting there. But when it does happen, we will no longer be dependent on burning chemically, chemically burning fuel to release a little bit of heat. We can actually fuse atoms and release energy itself, release photons or release neutrons that we then absorb back and run back in the system. And the system can infinitely cycle itself um, to, to create all the electricity we need infinitely effectively. Now, the big important question for humanity is what happens when we have that? And I would argue that we could actually make a lot of the elements that we need for all these systems, all the lithium, all the uh, heavy elements, everything that we consume as a species could be made in these fusion systems and could be made because the electricity now becomes free. Um, and so I think that there's a, there's, an, there's, a, there's a point in time here, this century, um, when plasma fusion systems really do um, kind of cross that mark where um, the energy output is greater than the energy input and they can run in perpetuity and they can just create electricity. And at that point, all these things that we always thought were limited natural resources become unlimited because we can now actually make heavy elements. We can make phosphorus, we can make iron, uh, we can make uh, uranium, we can make plutonium, um, we can make lithium, all these things that we're worried about running out of. And that electricity that's free, we can use that to desalinate water from the oceans and terraform the earth and turn deserts into rainforests if we wanted to, or um, you know, create incredible uh, advances in how we as a species live and thrive uh, you know, together with the, the other living organisms on this planet. Yeah. Um, and so I'm really excited about thinking about what's possible as the cost of energy goes down. Everyone's worried about the cost of energy going up because we're thinking in yesteryear's models of you know, burning oil. Um, but uh, in the future, I think that the cost of energy can and should go down as these, uh, these sorts of new technologies come to bear on Earth. And that's where we really transform as a species. Another reason why I'm so optimistic, by the way, with, with zero cost energy, go suck all the carbon out of the atmosphere, it would cost you nothing to do it. So we can very quickly resolve all the issues we have on our planet. And you combine that with automation and robots and industrial uh, and, and you know, automated systems of production, um, and humans can start to speak their intent on the earth and say, here's the thing I want. And then the AI and the automated machine goes and makes the thing you want with free energy. Um, and so there is this really interesting utopian, you know, kind of model that emerges as these systems come online um, that I think is really compelling to think about and, and makes me less worried and much more excited about the future. Yeah. I mean, you got me excited um, talking about this infinite energy resource and you were alluding to it, Dave, and I want to extrapolate just a little bit more, like what, what could this mean um, for civilization? Let's explore some of the bigger implications. Yeah, it's a tough question. I, I mean, this is one of those things where you know, when you said, um, when, when humans evolved from, um, I, I think I think there's three stages and we're in the middle stage. Um, humans went from being laborers um, where our physical bodies were used to physically do things. Um, and we're still very much, a lar large percentage of humans are still laborers. But there was this emergence in the 20th century of um, knowledge workers, as they're called. So many of us, I mean, look, you and I are sitting in front of a computer talking to each other. Um, we're not physically laboring 
uh, to, to manipulate and make things around us. Uh, some people still are, but automation is slowly starting to replace a lot of physical labor. And pretty soon, AI com combined with really good robotics is going to replace nearly every human labor. Um, so, you know, we're already seeing it with self-driving cars, but we'll eventually see it with uh, and, and automated factories and 3D printing. Um, I mean, the, uh, uh, the, the systems of automation and AI are sweeping across every industry. So humans are increasingly becoming creators. We create things that didn't exist before. And, um, and our creations show up in a, in a manifest way in the physical world. You know, we have so many more designers than we had 100 years ago, people that are designing visual and physical experiences. Um, we have so many more people that are uh, creators making, um, you know, visual and audio experiences for other humans. And that creator economy, and, and we spend so much more time enjoying and absorbing all of that creative content. And it really is incredible. Um, that the, you know, Steve Pinker has got a great book, Enlightenment Now, and he shows all the charts that show the relevant statistics of how humans have evolved over the last couple of centuries and why we should be optimistic. The number of wars are down. The number of murders per capita is down. The number of malnourished people is down. The number of calories is up. The lifespan is up. The number of people dying from diseases is down. I mean, across every category, uh, even, even measures of human happiness, some people would say, oh, social networks are ruining our brains, maybe to some degree, but like, there are certain indices of human happiness that have been tracked for a long time that are also improving um, around the world. And so we often fixate on the fear and the worry of the immediate moment. And it turns out that that's maybe a false narrative, that we really are evolving into a really um, a, a incredible state. So anyway, we've got this stage that I would argue where humans have gone from laborers to creators. And um, I think the next stage is narrator, where humans move from being creators to narrators because what I see happening in AI is that the role of the knowledge worker is being replaced by the AI. And so, um, you know, if you look at what an artist can do, um, an artist can create something that's never been created before. What if the AI can do that as well as the artist? Um, there's an incredible poignant commentary on human creativity. And I don't think he ever realized how poignant it was by a, hypnotist and magician out of the UK named Darren Brown. And um, he takes a couple of ad company execs and puts them in a, in a cab, drives them to his office. And he's like, hey guys, I want you to make me um, uh, come up with a name for a pet cemetery and an ad for the pet cemetery. And he comes back at the end of the day and they've been creatively toiling and brainstorming and coming up with all these great ideas. And six hours later, he predicted exactly what they would come up with. And he showed them uh, while they were driving in the cab, they passed by a bear and some kids wearing a, a name on a t-shirt and he subliminally influenced them. And they synthesized that subliminal influence into their creative output. And they didn't realize they had done it. And it says so much about human creativity that human creativity is largely driven in the same way as AI is, which is sensing, uh, synthesis, and then output or prediction. Um, and that human creativity arguably uh, can be achieved through AI. So then the question is, what does the human become if that happens? And I would argue that the human becomes the narrator. We then get to narrate the world we want to have around us. And the AI can resolve the creative content for us. And the automation can resolve the physical work that needs to be done to make that possible. Um, and then humans can go through a phase of, of um, e extraordinary uh, exploration um, uh, and, um, and consumption uh, and just narration of what it is we want around us. And so the human as narrator is really hard to see today, and it's really hard to talk about and to define. But I think having humans kind of clearly state their intent in the world and see that intent made manifest for them um, is a really powerful evolutionary state for us. Um, and it has a lot of very positive implications because you can create all sorts of rules around the creative systems and the, and the automation systems that, um, that preserve a lot of the values and the ethics that you care about in the world. Um, and it can object, it can use objective functions to solve for those things. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm really excited uh, about seeing that happen. And we're already, look, I mean, go to Dolly, which is the AI, you know, the- um, GPT-3, right? For creating yeah. art. Yeah, from a open AI. And it's incredible. You say like, hey, make something in the style of Rembrandt that looks like this. And imagine if that was a movie and you were saying to the movie, hey, um, I want a scene 
uh, you know, uh, four people, two couples sitting at a dinner table in a little um, bistro, change the lighting outside, make it 6 p.m., make it on the French, you know, make it in France, put it by a river. Uh, the waiter, the waiter is an asshole. I mean, you could start to really narrate a story without writing a script, without producing, without hiring actors. And the AI resolves the visuals, the music, the audio, the script. And um, think about this from a gaming context. Today, in order to play video games, a designer has to make and create that video game. They spend $100 million, tens of millions of dollars making that video game. I go in, we all play the same game. There's different experiences we have. But what if I could create my own video game? I could create my own virtual experience. I could create my own physical experience in the world. And it becomes this really incredible and profound transition of humanity to a world of narration um, that preserves, again, a lot of the ethics we care about in how those systems ultimately resolve that outcome. It sounds a little far-fetched, but I think we're a lot closer than we realize. Yeah. Does it make you like rethink like what the economic system would have to look like when you need more UBI and that sort of future? Or like, how do people make money? Like, how do they survive and live? Yeah. Um, look, I think um, we're, we're dealing in an inflation. We're, we're in an inflationary environment right now. Um, and generally, for a large percentage of Americans um, and people in the West, over the last two decades, there has been, relative to inflation, significant um, wage stagnation. So again, people always want to have more, so they feel acutely aware of the fact that they're not getting as much every year in increments as they had before, um, and there's a real sensitivity to this. So what I, what I will say is, um, uh, is something that people may take issue with, which is that over time, we have benefited from um, lower costs of nearly everything. Um, and that we do have this ubiquitous access to things that we didn't have 30, 40, 50 years ago. Just think about how much it used to cost to go to the movies, to watch two hours of film. And today we can watch six hours for free on our phones. Um, you know, the same is true with physical stuff. The same is true with a lot of services. And on a, um, an inflation adjusted basis and a wallet share basis, food prices are down significantly over the last 50 years. Um, and so there's a lot of um, technology that has actually been extraordinarily deflationary. The things that have been inflationary fundamentally are the things that the government supports. So when the government pays for pharmaceutical drugs because of it, it subsidizes healthcare, or the government subsidizes education through their student loan programs, the cost of those things goes up because there isn't a market pressure to deflate the cost and drive volume over time. That's not true with a lot of other categories. So all categories that have not been government assisted have seen costs come down. And ironically, all categories that have had government system have seen costs go up. I do not believe in UBI because I think it results in an inflationary outcome. Um, but I do think that there's a deflationary expectation that arises from this evolution of technology. And I do think that we've always been worried about what happens in the next cycle of human um, prosperity as um, new systems and new technologies replace the old. And every cycle, it's figured itself out. It used to be that what are all of the, um, you know, the drivers of, uh, or what are all of the horseback riders going to do when cars come to the streets? Oh my gosh, what are they all going to do? They found, you know, the, the market evolved. Um, you know, what are people going to do when factories automate and unions fight against this? And they fight against it and they don't want to see their union rep, um, uh, members lose their jobs. But the reality is eventually all factories will automate. All human labor will automate. And everyone that does work or would have expected to work in those jobs, new jobs always emerge. There wasn't 100,000 behavioral therapists a few years ago. There weren't yoga teachers. There weren't massage therapists. Um, there weren't um, hospice workers. Uh, there weren't um, uh, as many tutors. Uh, there weren't as many people that are creators that are creating their own brands and their own content online that could afford to do that and make money doing it. And there's this emergence of categories. Imagine everyone becomes a video game designer or everyone becomes a, a, a CPG beverage brand designer from their home. There's this whole emergent category of new jobs that um, we cannot accurately predict today. But inevitably, because of the way economic forces work and the way sociological phenomena evolve, eventually there will be demand for something that doesn't exist today that's enabled by the next evolution of systems. And as a result, we will see new jobs come out and people will be happier and better off than they were the last century. The transitionary period is always a fight. And it often results in revolution and the turnover of governments and 
It incites all of these different challenges and, 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 uh, and issues sociologically that we're tackling right now around the world. Um, but ultimately, the technology evolves, the technology moves us forward, and we cycle back, um, you know, governments, evolution, uh, economics, social, so, so, uh, social systems, all eventually cycle back and we keep moving forward. Um, so that's what I think, you know, m you know, is expected yeah. to happen. It's yeah, kind ugly, of makes, but, makes you want to yeah. wonder why, why, yeah, like I brought up that question, but like, yeah, why, why, why is there sometimes like fear around new technology? Cause it seems like you're right. There always has been, and then we evolve and it, it, it always seems to be like a much better future. I mean, like when the internet came around, all the studios are, you know, like, you know, they were like, Hey, we're going to lose our jobs. It's all the, the studio workers are going to lose their jobs. But now all of a sudden there's a hundred thousand people that are creating YouTube content and making money doing it. And it's incredible. It's a, it's more jobs than existed before. It's just different people doing different jobs, but the consumption category is still there. People still want to consume media. Um, and, uh, and I think that the fear is just, I don't know what I'm going to do individually. And that makes sense, right? You you've been working in a factory for 30 years you're expecting the pension. You care about taking care of your family and making money for your family and eventually retiring and leaving something for your family. You don't want to see your factory automated and you're going to fight with your union to keep that factory from automating. And it makes perfect sense. And um, you know there will always be that tension as technology develops and as systems evolve. Yeah. Um, one other topic I want to bring up with you, because um, I heard you discuss it on the All In podcast, but I would love for the folks listening to just get a deeper dive in. That is, um, you know, the solution to the protein folding problem. I was hoping you could speak to that and what the big dream is there. So, um, you know, DNA is made up of uh, four base pairs, right? We use these letters, A, C, T, and G. Everyone's learned that in high school biology, hopefully. But if you haven't, um, it's probably a good YouTube video. It does a better job <laughs> explaining it than I do. And... Um, Ultimately, what is DNA? Um, DNA uh, is organized into what are called genes. So a segment of DNA uh, is called a gene. And that gene, uh, all that it does is it codes, it's the code to make a protein, very simply. So your whole, your, your DNA, your, your human genome is about 3 billion uh, base pairs in length. So 3 billion of those ACTs and Gs split across... Um, a bunch of chromosomes, but that, that's, that, that's the whole of the human genome. And it's, it's chunked up into these genes. And each of these genes has a bunch of A, C, T, and Gs in a row um, that tell a little machine in your cell called the ribosome, which is also a protein, by the way, how to print a protein. So protein is made up of 20 amino acids, okay? These are just little molecules. And you can read the 20 amino acids, also learned about it in high school biology. You could read about it on Wikipedia. And so it turns out that all of DNA is really meant to code for what the sequence of amino acids is that goes in a row like a, like a beaded necklace. It's what beads do you put in a row to make that particular protein? And um, every three letters of DNA is the code for one of these amino acids, one of these 20 amino acids. So when a gene is expressed, that's the term that's used, which means a copy of the DNA comes out as RNA, which is a single strand, comes out of the nucleus of your cell, and it floats into the outer part of your cell, and it goes into a ribosome. And the ribosome sucks in that RNA, and it reads three letter strand, three letter segments. And every three letters, it pulls down an amino acid, and it sticks an amino acid onto the last amino acid, and out comes a long chain of amino acids. And that beaded necklace is a protein. And what then happens, Remember, all molecules, each amino acid is a molecule, right? It's made up of a, a couple of uh, hydrogen, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen molecules, uh, sorry, atoms. And, um, and so there's different, think about them as little pieces of, of little magnets. Um, and, uh, and they have different levels of attraction on different parts of them. So when you've got this necklace with these little amino acids on it, some of them attract to other amino acids and they start to stick together. And the way they all stick together clumps them down and they all collapse into a little clumpy ball. And that clumpy machine, which is now stuck together, all these amino acids are now stuck together, is the shape of a protein. And protein is a physical machine. The way that the amino acids move uh, that, that machine 
defines the function of that machine because sometimes they ro rotate, sometimes they're like a little jaw that opens and closes. And so proteins are little machines that do things in the body and in biology. A protein, for example, can be a catalyzer. So it can catalyze a chemical reaction to molecules that are floating around in a cell that otherwise would not have come together to react. The protein can actually attract the one molecule on this side, the other molecule on this side, and stick them together and force them to react. Um, a protein can also be an enzyme um, where it can break a molecule apart in two. So it can actually take a molecule and rip it in two and then split it into two different molecules. So it creates another chemical reaction. A protein like hemoglobin can stick oxygen into a little tiny pillow indentation it has. And the only thing that fits in that little indentation is oxygen. And then it moves it in your red blood cell to different muscle cells in your body and releases that oxygen. So your muscle cells can now get access to that oxygen. Um, and that protein just magically happens to do that exact function. So proteins are functional machines in biology. And so the code of DNA makes a string of amino acids that makes a machine that does something. So the protein folding problem in biology was how does the sequence of DNA or the sequence of amino acids turn into the physical machine? And what is the shape of that machine? And, um, and so by figuring that out, we can be more predictive about how changes in DNA can change the machine and how that might actually change what the machine does in the body. Um, and so what um, AlphaFold, what, which is a part of Google, uh, was able to do, it's part of Alphabet, and it was uh, done by a team called DeepMind, which Google acquired uh, for $400 million a couple of years ago. And this is a really uh, advanced AI team, best in the world. And they took all this data where these scientists over the years had cataloged the physical shape of proteins, mostly through X-ray imaging. So they, they shoot X-rays at proteins from different angles and create a 3D model of the protein. And then they take the DNA sequence that made that protein, and then they fed that into the AI. And they had this for hundreds and thousands of proteins. And um, all those uh, physical models and the DNA sequence are the learning data that the AI then uses to figure out how the AI can predict the physical shape of a protein just from the DNA sequence. And it turned out that Google AlphaFold can do this exceptionally well. And it can do it so well, in fact, that it's now beaten these records, that it's as predictive, if not more predictive, than the X-ray imaging itself. So it can really uh, highly resolve the, uh, the, the physical structure of the protein. OK, why is this interesting? So historically, we've been able to edit the DNA. And so we can edit the code of biology. Now we may be able to actually edit the function of biology. So if I can translate protein, um, the physical protein structure into what that protein does physically in a biological system, maybe I can actually resolve a number of ways that, that I can create a protein that can do a specific thing I want it to do. Um, and that really opens up this whole new realm of biology that historically has been unattainable because we know so little about biological interactions and how proteins interact with one another. I can create a protein that can bind to the very specific cancer cell I want it to bind to. Or I can create a protein that can very specifically pull some heavy element out of the environment. I can go pull all of the lithium out of the ocean and mine lithium with ocean water. I can create a protein um, that can uh, 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 break apart um, uh, plastics in the environment. Um, and I can create a protein that can you know, do some specific uh, uh, access, for example, uh, the inner membrane of a cell and ultimately access the mitochondrial membrane in a cell and create new therapeutic delivery systems for drugs that don't exist today. So we're now in a realm where the AI-driven um, systems that were demonstrated with AlphaFold can be leveraged or harnessed to create all sorts of new things in biology that allow us to engineer the biology of ourselves and our physical universe in a way that was previously um, impossible or unimaginable. And that's why it's so exciting. So there's this whole new realm where we're going from editing the code to editing the function in biology, and it's really profound. That is fascinating. Um, well, Dave Friedberg, I, I have a million more questions for you, but I don't want to take up any more of your time. And it was such a treat having you on the show and really grateful um, for you taking the time. Thank you so much. Dave Friedberg, CEO of the Production Board. Thanks, Julia.